following the deaths of the Gordians in Africa and the collapse of their rebellion against Maximinus Thrax in April of 238, the Senate found itself in an extremely difficult position. Having declared Emperor Maximinus a public enemy, it had to face the prospect of an imminent invasion of Italy. The Senatorial Emperors When the death of the elder Gordian was reported in Rome, the people and the Senate were completely bewildered, dumbfounded to learn that Gordian, in whom they had placed their hope, was dead. The Senate was desperate to find someone who could oppose Maximinus, and they acted with promptness and resolution, electing twenty of its most respected members to take charge of the government of the Empire and the election of a new emperor, choosing the men most distinguished for their age and merit, and they approved them by ballot. Other senators received votes, but on the final count, Marcus Claudius Pupienus Maximus and Decimus Caelius Calvinus Balbinus were elected jointly to the Imperial Purple. The idea of electing two emperors was a sound one, but instead of each emperor checking and balancing the other like the consuls of old and sharing the burden of imperial government, they squabbled about the most meaningless things. Papianus was named first in some official inscriptions, a source of irritation to his colleague who claimed he had a better aristocratic pedigree. Unfortunately, very little is known about the two senatorial emperors, but Pupienus was born circa 168, and that he started his career as a centurion primus pilus, before becoming a tribunus militum, and then a praetor. Pupienus's career was allegedly impressive, serving several important posts during the reign of the Severan dynasty. Most recently, he had been the city prefect. Albinus was born circa 178. He had held the consulship twice, once as Suffolk, and the second time in 213 as Ordinarius, with Emperor Caracalla as his colleague, which suggests he enjoyed the Emperor's favour. The people and the soldiers of the Praetorian Guard were in favour of the 13-year-old Marcus Antonius Gordianus, the nephew of Gordian II, whom I will refer to as Gordian III from now on. The Senate elevated the young Gordian III to Caesar, acknowledging that he was marked out as the successor of the two senatorial emperors. Balbinus was around 60 and Pupienus 70 when they were elevated to the imperial throne, so their reign was always expected to be short. And as predicted, Pupienus and Balbinus would only reign for 99 days. But during that short reign, the mint in Rome turned out an astonishing 29 different coin types for Pupienus and 23 for Balbinus. Ironically, although the two co-emperors detested one another, a common reverse type is a pair of clasped hands, with the inscription, Mutual Trust of the Emperors, which of course was pure wishful thinking. But because that appears on all the coins, it's likely something they agreed upon at the onset of their reign. Meanwhile, Maximinus Thrax was marching toward Italy and Rome, hell-bent on vengeance on the Senate and restoring himself as sole emperor of Rome. Papianus had more military experience than his colleague, so he was selected to go north and confront Maximinus, who was besieging Aquileia. Balbinus was to remain in Rome, in charge of the civil administration. Unrest in Rome In March of 238, the people of Rome were in the habit of coming to the Senate House to find out what the Senate was doing. Two veteran Praetorians in civilian clothes were perhaps too curious. They pushed themselves into the Senate, where they were promptly cut down by a senator named Gallicinus, who was carrying a concealed dagger. When the other Praetorians saw this, they were terrified by the fate of their comrades. Unarmed and fearing the size of the mob, they turned and fled. Gallicanus ran out of the Senate House, displaying the dagger in his bloody hand, and ordered the mob to pursue and kill the enemies of the Senate and the Roman people. The mob was easily persuaded, cheered Gallicanus, and set out after the Praetorians, hurling stones. The Praetorians returned to their camp and shut the gates, took up arms and posted guards on the walls. The people seized any tools they could find, made of suitable material, 
and fashioned weapons. They assembled and went out to the Praetorian camp, where they attacked the gates and walls as if they were actually organising a siege. With evening approaching, the besiegers decided to retire, since the civilians were exhausted. The people retreated in disorder, thinking that the few Praetorians would not dare to pursue so large a mob, but the Praetorians now threw open the gates and gave chase. They slaughtered the greater part of the mob. After following the mob for a short distance, the Praetorians returned and remained inside the walls of the camp. Balbinus issued an edict in which he pleaded with the people to stop their attack on the Praetorians and promised amnesty to the soldiers, offering them pardon for all their offences. But it had no effect. Daily attacks were launched against the walls. When the mob cut off the water supply to the Praetorian camp, the soldiers realised their predicament and opened the gates and launched an assault on the civilians who soon fled. Some climbed on top of houses and rained tiles and stones on the guardsmen. The Praetorians suffered greatly and decided to set fire to the houses. Because many houses were made chiefly of wood, the fire spread very rapidly and without a break throughout a large part of the city. Siege of Aquilia While Rome was burning, Maximinus was sieging Aquilia, but it soon became clear that his siege was a failure. His army was disaffected. Maximinus launched numerous assaults virtually every day, and the entire army held the city encircled, but the Aquileans fought back determinedly, showing real enthusiasm for war. Maximinus's food supplies were running low, and morale was even lower. The soldiers of Legio II Parthica had long been stationed in Alba Longa, not far from Rome, and many of them had families there, and perhaps fearing their safety, they decided to turn on Maximinus. He was killed, together with his son, and with their commander dead, Pupienus ordered his legions to return to their bases, but he decided to recruit Maximinus's German guard into his own service. The employment of German guards made it seem as though he was aiming for sole power, while the Praetorians began to worry that Pupienus might supplant them altogether and institute a German guard unit instead, which, considering the state of Rome at the moment, might very well have been his plan. The Aquileans immediately opened their gates and welcomed Pupienus into the city. All the cities of Italy sent embassies to him of their most distinguished citizens, clad in white and carrying laurel branches. Each group brought the statues of its ancestral gods and the gold crowns among the votive offerings. Papianus soon returned to Rome, where he was met by Balbinus, bringing with him Gordian Caesar. The Senate and the people welcomed Papianus with cheers, as if he were celebrating a triumph. For the rest of the time, the two emperors governed in an orderly and well-regulated manner winning approval on every hand both privately and publicly. The people honoured and respected them as patriotic and admirable rulers of the empire. The Praetorians, however, were privately disgruntled, not at all pleased that the people had demonstrated their approval of the emperors. When the Capitoline Games were drawing to an end, and all the people were occupied with festivals and shows, the Praetorians suddenly brought their hidden resentments into the open. Making no attempt to control their anger, they launched an unreasoning assault, rushing into the palace with one purpose, as they approached the aged emperors. Ironically, the rivalry between the two emperors proved to be their downfall. When Pupienus realised that the Praetorian Guard was coming to kill them, he wished to summon a sufficient number of the German auxiliaries who were in Rome to resist the conspirators. But Balbinus, thinking that this was a ruse intended to deceive him, he knew that the Germans were devoted to Pupienus, refused to allow him to issue the order, believing that the Germans were coming not to put down a Praetorian uprising, but to secure the empire for Pupienus alone. When the Germans heard what was happening, they grabbed their arms and hastened to the rescue. As soon as the Praetorians were informed of their approach, they killed the mutilated emperors, who had been dragged all the way from the palace to the Praetorian camp, leaving the corpses exposed in the street. The Praetorians took up Gordian Caesar and proclaimed him Emperor of Rome. Final Thoughts 
The experiment with two equal emperors was, in theory, a good decision, but ultimately a failure because of mutual jealousy and distrust, and finally their inability to win over the soldiers of the Praetorian Guard. A divided rule was nothing new for the Roman government, and it would prove to be part of the solution to rehabilitate the empire and end the crisis of the 3rd century. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content we make here on the channel. The next video in this series will be on Gordian III.